It's really, uh, really great to be here today, and, and certainly we've had a lot of uh, exciting information coming from Art, Lisa, and Victor. Uh, let me ask a question. Raise your hand, how many people believe AI big data is the economic and investment opportunity of our lifetime? Raise your hand. How many people believe that? You know, I, I think for, you can see through all the speakers today, and also for me personally, it's also the innovation opportunity of our lifetime. Uh, AI is going to transform all aspects of our lives. Many industries uh, generate, some people talk about $10 trillion of economic value uh, by 2030. But there's also major challenges. And you've heard, uh, Victor certainly talked about Moore's Law and Denard scaling and uh, some of the challenges relative to the old playbook of classic 2D scaling and that running out of gas. So we have that the past that was enabled by Moore's Law that made enormous changes in all of our lives, enabled some amazing things. But that playbook has run out of gas. And so the, the opportunity for us, really as innovators, is how do we enable this trillions of dollars of economic value? And the other thing I'll talk about are some of the barriers to adoption of AI and one of those is sustainability, power consumption. I'll give some more data on that, uh, but that's also a major challenge. But I would say for me personally, I've never been more stimulated, more exciting in my entire life uh, about the opportunity for what we do within applied materials and our opportunities to enable the future. So thank you very much. So in the future, every company will be a technology company. If you look at uh, AI big data, the opportunity to transform uh, the automotive industry. I was just in Europe. I, I was actually in Asia, Europe, US, uh, Israel last month. But in, in Europe, you can see that the automotive companies are all focused on the transformation and competition in that industry. The nature of competition is changing. Uh, certainly electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, the whole foundation is changing and it's changing very, very, very quickly. Uh, you can see this in, in retail, education, healthcare, and AI big data has the opportunity to create enormous value, uh, also democratizing areas like education and healthcare that can have a meaningful impact on the lives of all of us. Uh, for the future. So the economic benefits, the benefits to society are enormous. So when we think about AI big data, $10 trillion of economic opportunity, transforming all aspects of our lives, uh, it's also important to think about what really will determine the rate of adoption for this transformation. Certainly, you've heard many of the speakers today talk about speed of innovation. Uh, and I'll talk about that, how we're going to drive that forward. And it's not looking backwards. We can't get where we need to go in the future doing what we've done in the past. Uh, society acceptance of all of these changes of our lives, certainly that's a factor. Security and safety is another uh, factor. And then the other factor, the other fourth S, really that determines the uh, rate of adoption is sustainability. And I'll show some data that if we don't innovate with architectures, what does it mean relative to power consumption in the world? So again, when I talk to everyone in the ecosystem, there, these changes where technology will transform industries are inevitable. The economic drivers are inevitable, but also, Without changes in, in the fundamental infrastructure, there's going to be an impact on sustainability. And I'll talk more about that here today. So those are the four S's that are impacting the adoption. So when I, I talk today about different devices, uh, we all know AI, big data, you have edge devices, and those edge devices are exploding. You have cloud data centers, uh, and then you have communications. And then when you think about, and this is a big debate for many people in the ecosystem, what happens at the edge, what happens in the cloud, and there are a few laws that determine what happens. One is the law of the land, uh, data privacy and security, and certainly when you're in different parts of the globe, 
there's a very different framework for the law of the land that ter determines what's going to happen in the edge and what's going to happen in the cloud. You have the law of physics, latency, the speed of actions uh, and determinations uh, also are very, very important. If I'm in an autonomous vehicle, uh, I need instantaneous uh, actions uh, to be safe in that vehicle. And then the other is the law of economics, cost and efficiency. Those are the things that determine uh, what happens in the edge in the cloud. And I'll talk more about uh, all of this here during the, the presentation today. So I think we all see an explosion of devices. Today, I think one of the previous speakers talks to, talked about tens of billions of devices, maybe 20 billion devices today. And there are projections uh, that range from 500 billion to 1 trillion devices in the next decade. And again, this is really at the infrastructure of enabling technology to transform major industries. This is inevitable. And we'll have an explosion of these devices, creating an enormous amount of data that needs to be stored, processed to unlock the value and connect it. And at the foundation of all of this, at the foundation of this infrastructure, are semiconductor devices. So let me ask a question. What in 2018 generated more data, machines or people? So raise your hand. How many people think machines generated more data? OK, how about people? How many people? There's a few people here. There was actually a slide earlier <laughs> that gave the answer. Uh, I'll show this on the, on the next slide. But uh, you know, if you think about a person in terms of the amount of information that's being generated, it's something like a gigabyte per day. And if you think about an autonomous vehicle, I think Art talked about this earlier and talked about five terabytes per day being generated. Uh, this shows four terabytes or 4,000 gigabytes. It gives you an idea of the different scale relative to data generation. And again, it's also shifting very, very much from people to everything being smarter. So here's the answer. In 2018, it was the first year that machines generated more data than people. <clears throat> and if you look at this going forward, you have all of these smart devices generating a tremendous amount of information. Uh, again, in, in the car case, you have uh, six to eight sensors, LIDAR, many, many things that's a computer on wheels, generating uh, thousands of gigabytes per day in terms of information. So what you see going forward is that machines are generating dramatically more data. The amount of data that's being generated is increasing at a tremendous pace. This shows 70% compound annual growth rate. Uh, so that, that really is an opportunity. And we're seeing this certainly from applied materials today. If we look at our business, uh, the business that's coming from data generation, even in trailing technology nodes, is dramatically larger already today in the early innings of this inflection. We're already seeing more business going in that direction for generating those types of devices. So you've heard a lot today about architectures and the difference between general computing architectures and AI computing. With AI, you need very, very, very high-speed memory. And uh, people are even looking at in-memory computing uh, with future architectures. Extreme parallelism uh, for AI architectures. You can think about, you can work in parallel if you're processing an image, many different parts of the image at the same time. Uh, and then also much lower precision uh, is necessary for AI and big data. So very, very different architectures and very different computing approaches to unlock the value. Now, one of the things that also uh, is really, really important to understand is these new architectures uh, definitely are tremendously enabling relative to the speed of innovation. But it's also important to understand how long does it take 
to bring those architectures to market. So you can certainly in a lab create architectures that work with certain characteristics. But then when you go from the lab to high volume manufacturing and you want to make billions of those devices, billions of those structures at high yield, that's a whole different kettle of fish. It's much more difficult to take those structures from the lab to high volume manufacturing, high yield, and low cost. I'll give you some examples of that later today. But really, that is, that is at the foundation of how we have to drive innovation. So this model that we've built basically shows different workloads. And the architectures uh, are really optimized around, AI architectures optimized around different workloads. You have visual, audio, text, uh, and numeric workloads, different types of neural nets depending on uh, what type of workload you're, you're uh, working on. And then if you look at this today and in the future, basically what this shows is that the largest growth going forward for AI are visual workloads. And I'll talk more about this, uh, more, more about this later today. But machine to machine, machine data is growing very fast, and visual workloads uh, are growing very fast. So this, uh, this chart comes from uh, MIT Technology Review. I think this was last month. And these researchers basically uh, were developing neural networks for language processing. And what they noticed was their energy bills were going up at a very high pace. And, and really what, this, what they did was they compared what does it take to train this, this language neural net uh, and the amount of energy consumption for training was significant and equivalent to five automobiles in manufacturing and operating those five, five automobiles. So that's just a, a, a comparison relative to uh, new sources of data. You know, another one, if you think about uh, IP cameras in your home or in a city, uh, every one of those IP cameras, they have image sensors, processors, network connections, storage, they consume something like five to eight watts per every one of these devices. And I think uh, in China, around 2020, there will be 500 million of these types of devices deployed. So if you look at this from power consumption standpoint, you're talking about 12 terawatt hours, which is the equivalent of a nuclear plant, just in the deployment of one of these edge devices. It's, it's, it's significant, very, very, very significant. So when you model this and you look at the workloads, you look at all of the different types of devices that will be deployed uh, going into the future, and you compare this to what we see today. So you have traditional data centers, and then going forward to 2025, uh, you see that growth in terms of power consumption is not very significant. But what you see also is training and inference, how much power is consumed using existing technologies, and it's really astounding. It's astounding. It would say that building out for especially visual processing, image processing uh, in training and in the uh, text and numeric smaller impact, uh, AI data centers could consume 10% of global electricity. Think about that. You know, we think about, as technology leaders, we think about creating a better future. And certainly there's so many things that we can do with AI big data that will unlock a tremendous amount of value. But this is also very, very profound. We've actually modeled this out uh, into the future, and it really also talks about not just the economics, of innovation, but also the sustainability, leaving the world in a better place. Uh, so the takeaways from this, 80% of the future workloads will be neural nets, uh, and training is going to dominate the uh, power consumption from all of this. But this is also one of the barriers to adoption if we don't drive the innovation. 
So, we think about Moore's Law. And what you see here is an iPhone. Actually, if I go stand next to this, this is what an iPhone would look like with 1980s technology. <laughs> 14 meters tall. How many people think you could carry around 14 meters tall iPhone? How many people could afford, afford a hundred million dollar iPhone? <laughs> so you have this computer and you have a camera in your pocket. That's really the power of innovation. It's the power of innovation uh, and what we did with, drive, with driving Moore's Law uh, over the last few decades. So, people talk about Moore's Law, and the original paper was 50 years ago, 40 years ago, it was updated uh, to talk about doubling the number of transistors every two years. Uh, and certainly, uh, like I, I just showed here earlier, it had a profound impact, a profound impact on all of us. Every one of us has a computer in our pocket and a camera in our pocket because of what we've been able to accomplish. But I think also what you heard from Victor and what you heard from others, Lisa, uh, is that this classic Moore's Law 2D scaling has run out of gas, and you absolutely have to drive innovation in new ways. You can't look backwards. You know, sometimes people will argue, is Moore's Law dead? Is it not dead? And by the way, there are very passionate arguments on both sides of that. Uh, I think the key point is that innovation in the future has to be different. We have to think different. We have to drive innovation in a very different way. So power, performance, area, and cost, driving all of those uh, very important parameters at the same time isn't possible with what we've been doing in the past. So we've been talking about uh, the, the new playbook. How do we drive innovation going forward? And I would say, not only, as I said earlier, is, has there never been a better time from an economic and investment opportunity, but there's never been a better time as an innovator. Because the challenges we have in front of us unlock tremendous economic value, but also they impact sustainability. They impact what we leave behind uh, as leaders, as technology leaders. So we have this new playbook. You heard a lot today about new architectures uh, from a number of the speakers. 3D techniques, building structures in new ways. So enabling some of those new architectures in compute memory, for instance, uh, you have to build these architectures with different structures and you have to be able to do it uh, billions of times for all of those structures at high yield. That's very, very difficult to do. 2D to 3D NAND is one of the best examples we've seen over the last few years of a fundamental change in the architecture. We ran out of electrons in the cell, we were hitting physical limits, we were hitting uh, economic limits, and then we innovated in a third dimension. Uh, novel materials, new ways to shrink will still be there in place uh, features. Uh, and you heard also a lot about advanced packaging techniques. Major advances in all of these areas are necessary for us to get where we need to go for the future. And then for me personally, I'm super excited because within applied materials, materials innovation and structure innovation uh, are areas where we have tremendous capabilities and competencies. I'll show an example of that uh, here in just a few minutes. So when you look at the edge, cloud, inference, and training, uh, this really gives you an indication what needs to happen for performance per watt, throughput, and latency in all of these different areas. And I, you know, the earlier speakers talked about uh, different solutions, different architectures for these different types of applications, and the rate of adoption will be different uh, for all of these different markets. But it gives you an idea. It gives you an idea of what needs to happen. In cloud training, uh, performance per watt, a thousand times improvement is enormous but it has an impact on power consumption. It has a big impact on the economics. Uh, cloud inference, throughput improvements are a big focus, and edge inference uh, driving the new memory roadmap. So tremendous innovation has to happen in all of these different areas. And these are some of the new promising architectures. Uh, you heard some of this earlier today from some of the speakers uh, around new accelerators, near memory, 
uh, new memory technologies, in-compute memory, and novel high-performance high computing. And applied materials, we're working on all of these different technologies. And again, I would emphasize uh, that many of these technologies, you can make work in a lab with one structure. Making these technologies at high yield and high volume is a whole different ballgame. It is very, very, very difficult. And traditionally, adoption of new architectures takes a very long time. But all of us, that's the challenge for all of us. I personally believe that we have the capacity to innovate many times faster than we do today, and we have to do that as an ecosystem and as an industry. Okay, so earlier today we talked about uh, a product, and I'll, I'll show this product in just a minute, uh, from, for some of these new uh, memory technologies. And as I said before, applied, what we do better than anyone else, we have a very broad portfolio of different technologies to create structures, shape structures, modify structures, and analyze structures. And I'll show you an example of one of these products in just a minute that to me is like a miracle that we're able to do what we do. Uh, but it's really at the foundation of these new technologies. These, and, and this is an example of new memory technologies. But we're working across many different types of devices. Last year I was here talking about a 1,000 times uh, improvement in leakage current for the transistor. Uh, and that was certainly an eye-opener, and we're working on with many of our technology partners on that innovation. Uh, this year we're talking about some new areas where we're driving innovation. But there are many, many beyond what we're showing here today. So this is a, a new platform, and basically what you see here is what we call an integrated material solution. You have many chambers on this platform. Every one of those chambers can produce five different types of materials. We can go to very cold temperatures, very warm temperatures. You can prepare surfaces. Uh, we have onboard metrology. This is very, very, very innovative, probably the most sophisticated system that we've ever built. But this is the direction for the future. And let me show you, I'll show a video, I think, coming up here next. So you'll see how this works when the wafer is uh, moving through the system. So basically, you have 10 different types of materials that are being created on this system. And when you think about the number of steps that you have to go through, uh, and you're managing the creation of these materials, all of the interfaces, all of those material interfaces matter a tremendous amount. In this system, we're going to my, below minus 100 degrees centigrade on some steps. We're going to above 300 degrees centigrade on some steps. And it really has to, all has to do with materials engineering, materials innovation. You have to be able to uh, create those types of thermal conditions uh, to optimize all of these interface, interfaces and all of these different materials. Another thing that we're doing with this system as we build it, you have that uh, magnetic layer that's 10 angstroms thick. So another innovation that we have built into this system is we can actually see in that chamber as that layer is being created. Just a few angstroms. And we can see that to one one hundredth of a nanometer inside the chamber. So why is that important? When I'm creating this structure, if I take it out of vacuum, those materials oxidize immediately. So when you think about not just building a few in a lab, but when, I, when you think about building billions of these structures every day at high yield, this type of technology is absolutely critical, managing those interfaces, being able to see what's happening inside that process chamber. Those are tremendous, tremendous innovations that are a part of this integrated material solution uh, that we've developed within applied materials. So in the past, it's not that many of these uh, new technologies or architectures, uh, people couldn't conceive of them. It's how do I build them? How do I build them every day? How do I build them uh, in high volume with high yield? Those are some of the biggest challenges uh, that we have going forward. And these kinds of systems where I can, it's almost like 3D printing at an atomic level, 
uh, and, and creating all of this, these different types of materials and structures and interf interfaces, uh, it, it really is the future. Okay, and then, uh, you know, I, I deeply believe, as I said earlier, uh, we can't look backwards because we can't get where we need to go uh, doing what we've done in the past. So this really has a uh, comparison of a, of a neuromorphic uh, versus a von Neumann type of a thinking process. And I think you heard one of the things that's encouraging to me uh, from all the speakers today is we share a tremendous passion to drive innovation. We also share tremendous passion that we have to think differently. Certainly for us, inside applied materials, uh, we have to connect differently than we've ever done before. We're applying some of these machine learning techniques to speed up innovation by a factor of 10. Uh, we have to think differently. We also have to think differently in how we connect across the ecosystem. Uh, all the way from materials to systems, or as someone talked about earlier, systems back to the materials. All of this co-optimization, what I'm, what I'm finding uh, in talking to people through the ecosystem is many people don't know what's possible. They don't know what's possible. So they accept what's there today, uh, but I can guarantee you that the pace of innovation uh, will accelerate and that the winning companies will be the companies that can connect better and faster and understand what's possible and co-optimize how we create and drive innovation going forward in the future. In applied materials, we're making a number of different investments. Uh, in the Made in Technology Center, we have uh, many, many of these materials innovation techniques, integrated material systems, and there are some cases where the only place in the world where you have those capabilities to create those structures are in the Made in Technology Center. We made an investment uh, in the Meta Center, Materials Engineering Technology Accelerator. Uh, that is also focused on how do we accelerate these architectures and innovation uh, on those five vectors I talked about earlier. Packaging, that's another area where there's a need for tremendous in innovation. Uh, speakers talked about heterogeneous integration uh, from a, a standpoint of how you connect the chips together. We have tremendous technology there, but I also deeply believe there will be significant innovation. There are many barriers that are existing there today um, in, in the, the connectivity or the packaging technologies. Uh, that's another area that is a big driver for where we need to go. And then also from a chemistry perspective, really innovating with all of these new materials uh, is another area where we've made tremendous investments. Okay, so lastly, you know, AI is definitely the biggest opportunity of our lifetimes, uh, but also we face the biggest challenges from an industry perspective to enable the innovation. And as I've talked about earlier, the economic opportunity is enormous, but also we will limit the rate of adoption if we don't solve power consumption and some of these fundamental issues that impact sustainability. So this is a, a great time to be an innovator. Uh, we need to drive a thousand times improvement in performance per watt and also a, a tremendous acceleration, not looking backward in what we did in the past, but looking forward in enabling the future. Thank you very much.